Howdy neighbor, how is your garden growing? Today we're gonna talk about what's a plant, what will be in bloom, and the tips to keep you on track so that you can have the garden of your dreams in the sunshine state. And to keep this conversation on track, I'm gonna be using my handy dandy Wild Floridian Gardening Guide. So let's first talk vegetables. When it comes to the month of February, whether you live in North, Central, or South Florida, or you're a zone eight, nine, or 10, everyone can still be doing cold weather crops. Cold weather crops, if you're not familiar, are gonna be things from carrots, lettuce, onions, beets, all your brassicas, including broccoli, kales, cauliflowers. Whether you live in zone eight or nine, you should consider starting to use things like transplants, especially for some of your longer growing <laughs> cold weather crops like brassicas. If you live in South Florida, you should in general at this point avoid doing cold weather crops. Even if we're having a colder than usual winter, unless you have a transplant, starting many of these cold weather crops by seed is going to cause them to be very stressed and not very productive. Brings me to one of my tips when it comes to vegetables in the month of February is the difference between what we're growing in North Florida and South Florida starts to become quite a bit different. North Floridians, you can really focus on those cold weather crops like radishes and beets and potatoes. But this is the first month that if you've been thinking about things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and cucumbers, you should be starting them by seed. You can also, depending on the type of warm weather crop, go ahead and pick up transplants, but just be ready to keep them protected because we still have some cold snaps coming in the month of February. But if you live in my zone nines, my central Florida, we're starting to wrap up the cold weather season. So if you do want to get some cold weather crops, look for things that are kind of those quick turnarounds, fast to go from seed to transplant, or just go ahead and pick up transplants. If you're thinking of doing things like radishes, beets, or even lettuces, this is the time to get your last round of crops in before it starts to heat up. The beginning of February tends to stay cold enough where you don't need to worry about these plants going and bolting or fading out. But as we get towards the tail end of February, can be a little bit on the cool side, but we're gonna warm up pretty quickly as we head into March. Now, if you're not a South Floridian or in zone 10, you do still have time to get potatoes in the ground, those classic potatoes. Now, I have not been a big fan of growing those because I live in zone 10 and it's a real big struggle to grow potatoes down here. And it's much easier to grow just white sweet potatoes. <laughs> but if you're in North Florida or Central Florida, you still have some time in my zone eights and zone nines for potatoes. Now my South Floridians, you're in a very different spot. If you're a zone 10, Cold weather crops in general, it's just, it's too warm at this point for you to really get anything started by seed. You might be able to sneak something out if you go ahead and just skip ahead and buy some pretty good sized transplants. But in general, you really need to be focusing on wrapping up your warm weather crops. This is one of the last months for you to really, really focus on warm weather crops like your tomatoes and peppers, your eggplants and cucumbers. And February is gonna be actually the first month for my South Floridians, my zone 10s, to consider actually doing hot weather crops. So if you're into doing things like okras, roselles, sweet potatoes, now is the time if you want to go ahead and get seeds in the ground or start growing your own transplants, you should consider doing that. Now I wouldn't be too quick because remember the beginning of February oftentimes still has potential for really, really cold weather. But if you have a nice warm space for them, this is a great time to get hot weather crops. So since we're in a transition period, let me give you, if you're thinking about squeezing in some of those cold weather crops before it heats up in your area for my zone eights and nines, here's a couple of the varieties that I think will do really well for you for being quick turnarounds before we get too hot. So one of the crops you should consider is something like a butter crunch lettuce. They're actually pretty quick for you to get a pretty sizable head. And because they're a cut and come again, it's one of those crops that you can get, harvest a little bit, harvest a little bit, harvest a little bit. You don't need to even wait for this side for you to start harvesting. You could even start it at this size. I mean, I guess technically this size too, but you could do it at this size. And that's what we would actually recommend. So within about 30 days of putting your seeds in the ground, you could start to get something that's this size. Also, if you find transplants, this could be a good way for you to get something quite sizable relatively quickly. Feeling a little too wary of starting something by seed, go ahead and swing over to one of your local nurseries or even a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Usually in the month of February for my zone 10s and 11s, they are already starting to carry some of the classic vegetables in the smaller trays. 
So keep your eye out if you wanna get a better deal there or buy your local nursery. Now, if I was going to consider doing a brassica and I really, really wanted to start it by seed, I would do dino kale. Unlike many of the brassicas like cauliflowers and broccolis that will not like it when we start getting really warm, dino kale is one of the ones that actually went for me in zone 10. I'm officially gone from zone 10A to 10B if you wanna get a sense of this. I had kale going not only through the entirety of the spring, but this also went into June and July, which for me, are very hot and intense months. So if you've been really wanting to do something like a leafy green that's gonna go the distance and be in that brassica family, I would do something like a dino kale if you're at that transition point because this is one of the few plants that will actually go for a pretty good distance of the spring and into the early summer. Now, if you're looking for something that's other than leafy greens and actually will get you more of a classic vegetable, consider doing something like carrots, but go for kind of the shorter time span from seed to harvest. You're not gonna be able to, or you shouldn't in general, buy any pre-started carrot seeds. They don't like transplanting. It's a pretty common thing with root crops. I would go with something like these short and sweets. You can pick them up by seed. They only take 60 to 90 days for harvest. And even in our little bit warmer areas, you can still get a decent turnaround. If you're worried about things like sun intensity and heat, go ahead and put them in containers and then move them around into semi shady spots where it'll be a little bit cooler and will allow you to kind of finish off those carrots. Now, if you're looking for something really easy in the cold weather crop area, but you don't want to start by seed and you're getting intimidated by the other things, one of the easiest things for you to grow is you can grow green onions by just going to your grocery store and buying green onions, chopping off the tops, and then replanting them. These are ones that we replanted recently. And within a week or two, we already have this amount of growth. So even if we're really, really far behind in the season, you can already be getting a harvest in a couple of weeks. When it comes to things like these green onions, of course you can use them in lots of different dishes. We use them in a green onion soup, which for the month of February is actually really nice because who doesn't like a nice warm hearty soup? when it's cold out. Of course, if you're thinking about something like tomatoes, of course, the easiest type of tomato just to grow in Florida is this insanely shrubby plant. It's called Everglades tomato. And if you remember, there was a video where I took this out of the ground and just shoved it back in. And um, it's, it's, um, it's gotten quite large, it's quite bushy. If you're not familiar with things like Everglades tomatoes, they are current style tomato, which means they're really small, about that big. And you can throw them in everything from salads, I've made salsa from them. They're really easy to grow. They're very sweet. And you only need a couple plants to get a huge harvest. And what's great is if you're kind of on this late end with starting tomatoes, like in down in South Florida, they can handle the heat and humidity of Florida better than any other type of tomato. But no fear if you are like in Central Florida and North Florida and are starting to consider, well, what other varieties might I go and do? Here are a couple others to add to your list. Here's what we would call a early treat tomato. You can find these seed packets anywhere from Home Depot, Lowe's, Target, Walmart. It's one of those Fairy Morris packs. They make decent sized tomatoes. So they've got a couple months still to go in my garden, but it's one you should consider. And here we've got another variety that you might want to consider, which is 4th of July. This name is super deceiving. It probably works better in other areas, which is it's supposed to have nice sized tomatoes for 4th of July. But here in Florida, we would start them way too early and we would not have them in time. Again, they were very similar to the early treat. They're going to have that nice six ounce style tomato, so about that big. You can use them as slicers, you can use them to make salsas and sauces, and it can be an easy plant. Similar, you can just pick up the packets online or at places like Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever you kind of see those general seed pack aisle things. If you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I'm really good at starting seeds and I don't really wanna try it and find out this time. Well, I really, really recommend you check out your local nurseries for plants. You may consider going to Home Depots and Lowe's, but I will tell you the prices are way, way more expensive. When it comes to tomatoes, a plant this size, I don't know if you can see these tomatoes on here, this is a chocolate Cherokee. Typically, if you were at a Home Depot and Lowe's, this size plant would cost you about $20 to $30. But I was able to pick it up at Sweet Bay, one of mine, a local nursery that sells native plants for about $5 a plant. Here they have a purple Cherokee. And in past years, I've gone to other local nurseries like Wilcox where they've had plants that are a lot smaller. If you don't want to invest like in a $5 plant, they've had ones as low as a dollar to $2. So I highly, highly recommend go check out your local nursery and see if you can get some decent sized plants to get you ahead of the game. Those who are definitely in the hot weather crops, some of the things you should be thinking about is of course, seminal pumpkins. If you're not familiar with seminal pumpkins, just think butternut squash. 
they don't look like them, but they're in the same family. And essentially any recipe that there is for butternut squash, you can use a Seminole pumpkin. Especially for my South Florida, my zone tens, once you get Seminole pumpkin established, like in a zone 10, they can actually go almost the entirety of the year. These plants are not new. They are just the same plants rerooting and growing and throwing out pumpkins over and over again. So if you're looking for a low-ish effort plant that can produce tons and tons and tons of pounds, consider investing in some seminal pumpkin seeds. You can pick these up at places like Southern Exposure. Sometimes they're listed as seminal pumpkins or seminal squash. It's basically the same thing. Another plant you should consider, if especially my zone 10s to get started now, is sweet potatoes. There are so many different types and varieties of sweet potatoes from your classic orange to white sweepy potatoes. So if you're thinking about it, you can go ahead and do that. You can do it my way. Which is literally once you get the sweet potatoes, you just chuck them in the ground and put a little bit of mulch over it, and then it's like, bam, you got sweet potatoes. And of course this would be an early and quick harvest for my zone tens because you can start harvesting those greens as within, gosh, I don't know, within 30 days. You're gonna have leaves in 30 days and you can use those as a greens alternative. I wouldn't recommend them necessarily for salads, but they're a good addition for smoothies. Let's switch gears into herbs. Because we're in the winter time, you still have time Time for things like thyme, fennel, parsley, and of course, cilantro. Now for my South Floridians, it might quickly go to coriander, but you do have a little bit of time because the sun intensity isn't quite up there yet. So do try to get yourself some cilantro in the ground before it bolts. Now, if some of you are feeling a little bit bad because you didn't get garlic started, back before winter and you didn't go and get onions started a couple months ago, but you're longing to add those flavors to the cuisines and to your harvest, you can go and invest in something like chives. You have the option of doing both onion or garlic chives. So if you're okay with having dishes that don't use necessarily the garlic bulb or the onion bulb, you can invest in something like a onion chive or a garlic chive and still get really strong flavors all throughout spring and summer. Let's talk fruit. When it comes to the month of February and planting different fruit types crops, there are only a few for most of the state that actually will work. And that really is sugarcane, pineapples, and ginger. These are plants that can actually handle the cold of Florida. But if you're kind of planning ahead, you want to make sure that you have year round harvests of fruit. There are still fruiting plants that are putting out harvests. Definitely recommend adding citrus to your future plants because citrus is a great producer in the winter time. Whether you want to go with things like oranges, lemons, limes, grapefruits, or one of my favorites to tell people to start with, which is the Kalamondin, AKA the Kalamanzi. You can pick these up at Home Depot's Lowe's and some of your local nurseries. It's a very small plant, compact, and you can actually grow it in a pot. But if you're looking for something beyond citrus that is starting to be able to produce, let me recommend this, mulberries. While it can be challenging for many parts of the state to be able to grow classic berries like blackberries and blueberries and strawberries, mulberries are ridiculously easy. I highly recommend either our native mulberry or the everbearing mulberry. This puts out huge harvests. I have found that with my everbearing mulberry, which is technically a large shrub slash small bush, that I can get anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds per plant of berries, which is like a lot. It's like a lot, a lot of berries. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with mulberries, I would say there's somewhere between a blackberry and a raspberry when it comes to flavor and texture. And what's great about this fruiting tree is it doesn't take years and years and years to get your first harvest. For me and my mulberries, it only took about 18 months from the first time that I planted them to get a decent sized harvest and for actually the plant to pay for itself. If you're thinking about year round harvest, I would definitely consider adding a mulberry shrub or an everberry mulberry to your list. Now, before we jump into some of the blooms, let's hit a couple of the tips that you should be thinking about for the month of February. Especially when it comes to your vegetable and herb crops, you need to be thinking and watching out for the weather still. While we are starting to head towards the end of winter, February, just as much as January, has very significant cold snaps that can lead to damage to your crops and some of your critical plants that cannot handle those freezing temperatures. But with this really cold weather, you can actually take advantage of it when it comes to certain plants. That's why I actually recommend in the month of February that you do some pretty significant surveys of your land and look for areas that have a lot of invasive weeds. Whether you use natural methods or you use chemical methods, most weeds in your yard right now are tropical in nature and they are super stressed, which means that anything that you do to get rid of them, whether it's 
put water on them so that they freeze or you dig them up or you apply a local herbicide it decreases the chance that these plants get a really good foothold as everything warms up and then they have the chance to take off so take advantage of the colder temperatures to really work on spots that have aggressive weeds in them february is still in the middle of drought season which which means your plants with shallower root systems can get more stressed out and if you don't have the time to be constantly checking your soil to see if it's dry enough or wet enough you should consider adding a mulch to your vegetable garden beds and anywhere you have new transplants to help maintain that moisture one from evaporation and two from it just running through our sandy sandy soil and applying a mulch at this time of year is actually a very wise thing to do because this can act as a double duty not only helping you maintain moisture better but also suppressing those weeds that are just about to get ready to take off another thing you should be thinking about as we are in the month of february is are there any really large infrastructure projects you need to do Yes, the colder weather can make it a little bit more stressful for making sure we don't have cold snaps, but the cooler weather is actually nice when you have to go and do larger projects like build trellises or put in large raised garden beds. Yeah, I know my husband and I have a very long to-do list for the month of February so that we can knock those out before it starts heating back up. Now this next tip, whether you live in a zone eight, nine, or 10, one of the things you guys need to be thinking about is, is adding flowers for pollinators. Why? Well, so many of you have been focused on warm weather crops, whether they're tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants. One of the big differences between cold weather crops and warm weather crops is warm weather crops need pollinators to give you really good harvests. And if you really want to maximize your harvest, besides doing all the usual typical vegetable gardening tips, one of the best ways you can increase it with very low effort is adding pollinator friendly blooms to your garden. Which brings me to my next area. Let's talk about native flowers and what will be blooming in the month of February so that you can attract the most pollinators to your garden and increase your vegetable harvest. My number one pick for blooms this month hands down if you want to add something to your garden that's going to bring in bees that will help you with tomatoes and peppers for sure and eggplants i would be adding tropical sage it comes in three colors which is you have the coral red gorgeous white and my favorite flamingo pink are amazing attracting pollinators so whether you're looking for bees or butterflies or you can get even a bonus with hummingbirds Tropical sage is definitely something if you're a beginner when it comes to native plants to add to your garden. I don't know if I dare recommend this, but one of the hands down best pollinator plants this month is Biden's Alba, AKA Spanish needle or beggar's tick. It's got a lot of names that aren't really cute, but Biden's Alba is its scientific name. Biden's Alba is actually a critical plant that is the third most common source of pollen and nectar for our pollinators in the state of Florida. But I hesitate to recommend it because this thing is such a prolific reseeder that once you have it in your yard, you may never get it back out. So you can do what I've done before, which is I put it in a pot. And as soon as it's done blooming and starting to head to set seed, I just cut off the flowers and I chuck them. What's great about Biden's Alba is it, it will bloom and bloom and bloom again, actually almost the entirety of the year, but it looks its best in the winter months. Basically January and February is when it kind of has these gorgeous, gorgeous super blooms. You can often see it along the highway. You will see huge patches of white that is Biden's Alba. But if that seems a little like, ooh, I don't know about that, Jacqueline, I'm thinking I would like something that flowers and maybe can almost be like a hmm, herb substitute, add some aromatics to my garden and isn't likely to take over my entire property. And that would be something like scrub mint. This is a great plant. You could actually plant it really close to your vegetable garden or you can put this in a pot. It is great at attracting bees. And just like the name says, scrub mint smells like mint. It's pretty compact. So if you plant it, it's not gonna go everywhere and it doesn't look quite as wild as some of our other native wildflowers. Another one that I would really, really recommend, especially if you're looking for a burst of color, my zone 10s right now, Beach Verbena looks so good oh my gosh it is looking so good right now and it is a favorite of butterflies now while february is gonna on the front end be a little bit too cold for butterflies as we get to the back end of february you really do want to have these high nectar plants like beach verbena so that as our monarchs start coming out cloudless sulfurs white peacocks all these different butterflies you're gonna have some really good nectar sources available for them and they'll be attracted to yours you also get bees so if you want to go ahead and put this near something like your vegetable garden and create a really cute border with it 
this would be one of the plants I would recommend. Now, if you're looking for something that's not quite as annual and more perennial, something that'll be there year after year and is gonna give you some really good sized blooms, let's talk about our large shrubs to trees that can add color and can bring pollinators to your garden. For my people who are into edible plants, of course, the Chickasaw plum will be going into bloom. This is our native plum to Florida. There are a lot of actual native edible plants. So if you're into the plums and you're in North and Central Florida, consider adding Chickasaw plum plum to your garden so that you are getting February blooms. Other gorgeous native small trees that you should consider adding to your garden from North and Central Florida would be plants like Eastern Redbud, Eastern Dogwood. Now, if you're interested in having something that's more fit in the cottage garden slash could be in a wild, <laughs> wild landscape, French Trip is actually a really amazing one. And if you've ever seen one up close, oh my goodness, are they covered covered in bees. Also for my North and Central Floridians, you can also add things like Japanese magnolia. This isn't our native magnolia. This would be an exotic magnolia, but it can actually survive in North and Central Florida and the Taiwan cherry. Now, never fear my South Floridians. There's still a lot going on in your area. You should be considering adding things like bougainvillea, which has been in bloom all over the place in my zone 10, or you can also add your Hong Kong orchid. But if you're looking for a native plant that may go into a super bloom and also help you attract birds, you should consider Marlberry for South Florida. This native tree is one of many that I recommend in this video right here, where I talk about 10 different native shrubs and trees that you can use to attract birds to your garden. If you're thinking about getting into native plants to attract pollinators, these are my 10 beginner native plants that I would recommend. And if you're thinking about warm weather crops and you wanna know my five top easiest recommended plants for the Florida, go ahead and check out this video right here. You can get this plus more tips in the Wild Floridian Garden Planner. So go ahead and pick that up right here. Okay. I'll I'll see you soon. Bye.